Well, we're on our second Sunday of Advent, meaning preparation. And I couldn't think of any better Advent theme this year than Home Alone. This is the year many of us <clears throat> find ourselves alone for the holidays. Maybe it's for the safety of others. Maybe it's for our own safety. Regardless, before the pandemic, December was considered the loneliest month of the year when depression and loneliness reach an annual high. And now, if we throw the pandemic on top of it all, I'm sure we'll break some records, unfortunately. A disturbed and deeply troubled individual went to a psychiatrist to relieve his anxiety. He awoke melancholy every morning, and he went to bed in the evening deeply depressed, and his day was marked by darkness and clouds. He could not find relief from his anxiety, and in his desperate condition, he decided to seek the help of a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist listened um, to him for almost an hour. And finally, he leaned toward his patient and said to him, you know, there's a local show in town. Um, at the theater, I understand that there's this new Italian clown. And he's leaving the people laughing in the aisles. He's getting rave reviews from the critics. Maybe, maybe he's the one that will bring back your happiness. Why don't you go see this professional clown and laugh your troubles away? And with a sad expression, the patient muttered, Doctor, I am that clown. Psychologists and other trained personnel have discovered that the one element common in all cases of depression is disappointment. Something happens that causes a person to lose his or her sense of reality and focus. Depression is both ancient and universal and is still an ever-present problem that knows no educational, cultural, or financial boundaries. Depression is experienced by almost everyone at one time or another. One of the major health problems of America in 2020 is depression. The National Institute of Mental Health estimated that their, in their latest report, which was 2018, that 7.1% of all adult Americans, which is about 17.3 million, suffer from depression annually. The prevalence of adults with major depression is higher among females and the young adult age group. This costs the nation almost $27 billion in lost productivity. So it's not really a laughing matter. History records that some of the world's greatest folks has fought this enemy, like Martin Luther, Winston Churchill, Beethoven, Abe Lincoln, Tolstoy, Charles Spurgeon. It has been called the Black Dog, the Dark Night of the Soul, the Slow of Despond, Operation Fatigue, and Anxiety Neurosis. Many persons have shared that it seems that profanity replaces the praise of God. And just consider anyone with post-traumatic stress disorder, prisoners of war especially. There was an Englishman, an Irishman, and an Italian who were taken prisoner. And they take the Englishman back and hog tie him and they whip him and beat him senseless. And after two hours of being brutally tortured, he spills all of his secrets. He just can't take it anymore. Then they take the Irishman back and hog tie him, whip him, and beat him senseless. After four hours of being bashed, bloody, and bruised, he tells his captors everything. Everything that he knows, because he just can't take it anymore. Finally, they take the Italian and hog tie him, they whip him, and they beat him senseless. The other two men could hear him crying out in pain. For nearly ten hours as he was tortured, but his captors couldn't get him to tell them anything, so they let him go. And when the three men regrouped outside, the Englishman took a sip of whiskey from a flask, set his hand on the shoulder of the Italian, saying, How did you go so long without saying anything? To which the Italian replied, I couldn't talk with my hands tied behind my back. And the chronic fear of getting hurt is another source of depression. We do a lot of things to keep from getting hurt. Safety masks, safety harnesses, looking both ways, practicing caution, handrails, helmets, padded equipment, yet we can't go through life without getting hurt. 
It actually happens no matter what. Spraining a wrist, breaking a bone, twisting an ankle, and that's if we're lucky. It gets worse. Every time I drank coffee, I would get this sharp pain in my eye. And I've learned now to take the spoon out. My son accidentally smashed his foot on the table, and as he was hopping around the room screaming in pain, I rushed to the phone, picked it up, and asked him, do you want me to call a tow truck? <laughs> yeah. I didn't think that would land. <laughs> Have you ever felt the extreme anxiety, though, of not just getting hurt, but being hunted? Like someone's actually out to get you. Victims of bullying are probably as close as any of us got to that feeling. It's rare, but it is a scary thing to feel like someone wants to hurt you. A wife shouted down to her husband from upstairs, Do you ever get a shooting pain across your chest like someone's got a voodoo doll and they're stabbing it with a needle? No, he called back. She shouted, How about now? Many who are alone, especially at night, might have this feeling. Any small noise can raise our hairs and eternal alarms. Just the house breathing can induce panic attacks. Fear of thieves, murderers, or personal assault can render us immobile. Due to the virus, many have shut themselves off from the world for fear of suffering. Yes, when days seem evil and full of trouble... When life itself is collapsing around us, when bad times are upon us, we need a place to turn to. We then turn to our faith in a new way to see how we can cope, how our faith in God enables us to keep on keeping on that sacred journey. Yes, there are those moments in our sacred journey when we feel as if a ton of bricks has fallen on us. It is the single biggest obstacle for non-Christians to overcome in order to become believers in Christ. George Barna, who is the George Gallup of the Christian world, conducted a national survey in which he asked this question. If you could ask God only one question and you knew he would give you the answer, what would you ask? By far and away, the number one response was this. Why is there evil, pain, and suffering in the world? And you see, the very question assumes that a loving God and suffering cannot go together. Many of us remember one of the most famous trails in the 20th century, the tri trials of the 20th century, the O.J. Simpson trial. After what seemed to be an airtight, open, and shut case with overwhelming evidence that pointed to O.J. Simpson as the murderer of Nicole Brown, his ex-wife, and Ron Goldman, and when the judge's clerk, Deidre Robertson, read the jury's verdict of not guilty, Nicole's mother looked up and said, God, where are you? Ask any pastor, and they will tell you that one of the questions asked most often of them in their ministry is this. Why is this happening to me? Why, God? Why? If you've never asked that question, where is God when it hurts, one day you will. There are three basic problems that are common to everyone, everywhere, at some time in this life. They are sickness, sorrow, and suffering. You may temporarily escape one or even two. But you will never escape all three. Even the most godly of people are not exempt from pain and suffering and is never promised by God. And the purpose of the Christian faith is not to avoid difficulty and trouble, but to produce a character adequate to meet it when it comes. However, depression does not need to be an overwhelming problem. Face it. Admit it. Seek the power of God and the presence of other people to help you move through the dark valley of despair and discouragement. For persons in the Christian faith, the Psalms have been a great source of comfort and most beneficial to get through this part of our pilgrimage. King David, the man described as having a heart after God, was hunted many times in his life. When he was young, after defeating the giant Goliath, he was hunted by his own beloved king, Saul, whom he served out of jealousy. Towards the end of his life, he was hunted by his own son, Absalom, who wanted to usurp the throne. Let's look at one of King David's prayers when he was hiding from his son who would try to kill him. 
Psalm 142. And we see that God's servant David is afraid of getting hurt. See if this doesn't sound familiar or similar to your prayers. Psalm 142, 1 through 7. With my voice I cry to the Lord. With my voice I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before Him. I tell my troubles before Him. When my spirit is faint, you know my way. In the path where I Walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look on my right hand and see. There is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me, and no one cares for me. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Save me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me for you deal bountifully with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you illuminate this psalm that we might understand its context and its application for our own lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the greatest challenges to the psalmist and to many in ministry that have experienced depression despair and disillusionment is that the wicked and evil doers somehow seem to profit. Dr. Harry Fosdick said this, once I decided that I could not believe in the goodness of God in the face of the world's evil, but then I discovered that I had run headlong into another and even more difficult problem. What to do about the world's goodness if there is no God? Sunsets and symphonies, mothers Music, the laughter of children, great books, great art, great science, great persons, victory of goodness over evil, the long, hard-won ascent up from the Stone Age, and the friendly spirits that are, to other souls, cups of strength in great agony. <clears throat> How can we, without God, explain all of that as casual, accidental, byproduct of physical forces going on at it blind. The mystery of evil is very great on the basis of a good God, but the mystery of goodness is impossible on the basis of no God. The priest Henry Nouwen, in his outstanding book, The Wounded Healer, shares how our woundedness and loneliness can be God's grace, become a source of beauty and strength when it is understood as being a vital part of the fabric of life woven by the master weaver. He uses the imagery of the Grand Canyon, which is a deep incision in the soil, but produces great beauty and scenery. So too, our woundedness can become a source of beauty and understanding for our journey and for others. Remember, soil never produces a crop until it is broken and the seed can be planted. It is when we declare our utter dependency on the power of God that God can do something for us. We are now out of the way and God can do His best work in us. Evelyn Underhill, an insightful writer on the spiritual life, shares this. God's power comes into action at the very place where our actions fail. One of the greatest breakthroughs any Christian can make is to know, to really know that Christ cares for you. The late Joe Gragiola, former co-host of NBC's Today Show, told of a visit that he made to a local drugstore. He said, from the shelves, I selected a bottle of extra strength Tylenol, 12 ounces of uh, kaopectate, an elastic knee support, a supply of corn plasters, some Dristan, a vaporizer, a remedy for sore gums, and a tube of Preparation H. I took all of that stuff to the counter where they rang it up on the register and I couldn't believe my ears when the clerk handed me all of these prescription drugs, uh, over-the-counter drugs, and said, have a nice day. You and I know that life is full of cycles that we travel through. For every day the sun is shining, there is a day the clouds seem to cover up everything. All sun and no rain produces a desert, not a beautiful garden. We will have nice days. We will have tough days. Our salvation is secured 
not because of what we do, but because of what Christ did for us at Calvary. In Psalm 142, verse 6, the writer declares, Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. The psalmist takes his problem to the only one who can really be of any help and comfort for him. The psalmist further declares in verse 7 that he knew God would deal bountifully with me. That is our hope, that God keeps his promise to his people because God stands with us in our fear of suffering. There's a playlet entitled The Long Silence that says it all. It's actually a video clip, but our system won't play it today, so I will read it for you. This is The Long Silence. Billions of people Never mind. gathered in the vast space before God's throne. Some shrank back from the brilliant light before them, but many other groups talked heatedly, not cringing in shame, but with belligerence. How can God judge us? What does he know about suffering? Snapped a gray-haired woman. She tore open her sleeve to reveal the tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror beating, torture, death. In another group, an African-American lowered his collar. What about this, he demanded, revealing an ugly rope burn, lynched for no crime but being black. In another crowd, there was a pregnant schoolgirl with sullen eyes. Why must I suffer, she wondered. I didn't consent to this. It wasn't my fault. Far out across the plains, there were thousands of such groups, for each had a complaint against God for all the evil and suffering they had endured in his world. How lucky God was to live in heaven, they said, where all was sweetness and light, no hunger or hatred, no violence or fear, no corruption or injustice, not even any sickness or sorrow. What does God know about what the human race has had to endure in this world? And after all, God leads a rather sheltered, even a privileged life, they said. So each of these groups set forth a representative, chosen from among themselves because they had suffered the most. A Jew, a black man, a survivor of Hiroshima, a terribly and horribly deformed arthritic, an AIDS victim, someone who had recently died in a pandemic. In the center of this vast plain, these leaders consulted with each other. And at last, each representative was ready to present their case to God. They declare, before God could be qualified to be our judge, he must endure what we have had to endure. Their decision was that God would be sentenced to live as a human being here on earth. Let him be of a despised race, a Jew, born in poverty-stricken conditions. Let the legitimacy of his birth be questioned. As a child, let him be forced to flee as a refugee and spend several years as an undocumented alien in a foreign country. Then let him be given a work that is humanly impossible. Let him be betrayed by his closest colleague into the very hands of those who hate him. Let him face false charges, fake news. Let him be tried by a biased jury and convicted 
by a cowardly judge, all in the name of keeping the peace. And the last, let God see what it is like to be totally alone, forsaken by those he had tried to help. Let him be tortured, then let him die. No, wait. Let him die in the most excruciatingly painful and humiliating death possible. As each leader presented their portion of God's sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from among the assembled crowd. When the last leader had finished presenting their part of God's sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered a word. No one had anything to say. For suddenly, everybody knew that God had already served their sentence. When you come to that time in your life where you are in the middle of a sickness, sorrow, or suffering, just look at the cross and remember that God stands with you in your suffering. God speaks to us through our fear of suffering too. Have you ever asked God to heal you of a sickness or relieve you of a sorrow? or alleviate your suffering, but he didn't do it? Well, join the club. Sometimes we are so busy telling God what he ought to do for us that we can't hear God telling us what he wants to do in us. That's why C.S. Lewis called suffering and pain God's megaphone. Here's what he said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. It is, his meg it, is, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God's answer to grief is grace. More than anything else in the world, God wants us to experience his grace. He wants you and I to experience it on a daily basis. There's no other venue where God shows His grace more strongly than in pain, sorrow, and suffering. In fact, remember this, there is no grace without suffering. And there is no grace apart from suffering. God strengthens us by our fear of suffering. We have already established that everybody is going to experience sickness, sorrow, and suffering. There is no such thing as a pain-free life. What determines victory or defeat is how we are affected by the suffering. If it leads to resistance, resentment, and bitterness, then we will lose out to depression and despair. If it leads to prayerfulness, patience, faith, and trust, then it can lead us to maturity and victory. God's strength comes into its own in our weakness. Once we believe that, really believe that, then our fear of suffering will diminish. We'll quit focusing on the handicap and begin to appreciate the gift. Victor Frankl, a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust who spent years of his life in a concentration camp, said, <clears throat> meaning only has suffering provided that the suffering is unavoidable. If it is avoidable, the meaningful thing to do is to remove its cause for unnecessary suffering is masochistic rather than heroic. If, on the other hand, one cannot change a situation that causes his or her suffering, they can still choose their attitude. We can look at suffering either as an enemy to avoid or as a master to surrender to or a servant that God can use to minister in our life. Whenever we are weak, God gets the opportunity to show his strength. God can take the greatest pain and suffering in the history of humankind on a cross 2,000 years ago and turn it into salvation for all who would believe. God would, des God would preserve David's life, returning him to the throne 
despite all of his son Absalom's efforts. And there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Jesse was a farmer and a shepherd in Bethlehem, but he was also King David's father. Jesus is the direct descendant of David. Jesus Christ, the shoot from the stump of Jesse, endured the greatest suffering of all so that you and I would not have to endure the eternal pain and suffering of an eternity apart from God. Because of Jesus Christ, we will no longer have to fear pain or suffering in this life and even more importantly in the life to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate this meal that was given to us at a great cost of yourself, that your suffering and pain 